Microadenoma means it is less than 1 cm in diameter and macroadenoma means it is more than 1 cm in diameter. 5% cases of microadenomas they proceed to macroadenoma and 30% they resolve spontaneously. Now whenever there is a pituitary uh, a prolactinoma or an adenoma which is secreting prolactin there will be hyperprolactinemia obviously. What are the consequences of hyperprolactinemia? The consequence of hyperprolactinemia number one is galactoria. So the patient will present with galactoria. Number two, prolactin, it inhibits GnRH and it inhibits LH and FSH. This is the reason for lactational amenorrhea also. In during lactation, the levels of prolactin are high and prolactin in turn inhibits GnRH, LH and FSH and this is the reason for lactational amenorrhea. Another question. Now because LH and FSH they are decreased by prolactin, this female will complain of amenorrhea, secondary amenorrhea. She will complain of an ovulation. Because of an ovulation, what will happen? She will complain of infertility. And because there is decreased LH and FSH, so in turn the levels of estrogen will also be decreased. So the patient can complain of delayed puberty. Besides this, the pituitary tumor, it can also lead to cavernous sinus features of cavernous sinus syndrome. Now the features of cavernous sinus syndrome are headache, blurring of vision. So if in the question they say that there is a female who is complaining of galactoria, headache, blurring of vision it should always raise the suspicion of a pituitary tumor if you do an x-ray of the cella you will see that there is a space occupying lesion the diagnosis it can be confirmed by mri and how do you manage an adenoma if it is a micro adenoma and the patient is asymptomatic you can wait and watch you simply have to uh, keep the patient in regular follow-up that means you have to do serum prolactin levels and mri after every 12 months and if because of decreased estrogen patient is having osteopenia hot flushes you can give estrogen replacement uh, therapy whenever you are giving estrogen replacement therapy i have always told you that Estrogen replacement therapy with an intact uterus can lead to endometrial hyperplasia. So you have to give progesterones along with estrogens. If the microadenoma is causing symptoms, if microadenoma is symptomatic, you have to give drug of choices, bromocryptin or capgolin. Now, if it is a macroadenoma, in case of macroadenoma, again the drug of choice remains the same. You have to give bromocryptin or capgolin and you have to keep the patient in regular follow up. That is, you have to do serum prolactin levels and MRI after every six months. If the patient does not respond to uh, this medical therapy or if the patient has persistent blurring of vision or starts having visual loss, that is an indication for surgery. That is all what we have to know in case of a uh, pituitary tumor. In compartment 3, another important cause of secondary amenorrhea is Sheehan syndrome. Sheehan syndrome, it is a syndrome which results from ischemic necrosis of the anterior pituitary gland due to spasm in the arterioles supplying the anterior pituitary gland which occurs after childbirth. If a female at the time of childbirth has had postpartum hemorrhage, then that leads to Sheehan syndrome. Now the question which might come to your mind is that why is only the anterior pituitary gland affected? Why not the posterior pituitary gland? The answer to this question is that at the time of parturition, the blood supply to the pituitary gland is redistributed with advantage to the posterior pituitary gland and disadvantage to the anterior pituitary gland. So when there is spasm of the arterioles, the anterior pituitary gland is affected.
Now when 75% of anterior pituitary gland is destroyed, it is results in Sheehan syndrome. And when 95% of anterior pituitary gland is destroyed, it results in a full blown picture and that is Simmons disease. The hormones of the pituitary gland, all of them will be affected. The first hormone to be affected is growth hormone, another question, which is followed by LH, FSH, TSH and ACTH. This is the sequence in which all the hormones are affected. Most common, most common hormone which is affected is prolactin. Now the manifestations of Sheehan syndrome will depend upon all these hormones which have decreased. So the manifestations are because there is less of prolactin, this female after giving birth to the child will experience failure of lactation. Because LH and FSH are decreasing, there will be amenorrhea. Then there will be increased sensitivity to cold due to hypothyroidism and the female will have loss of libido. The signs of Sheehan syndrome again are based on the hormones which are decreasing. For example, because there are as adrenal cortical failure, because there is less of ACTH, this female will have decreased axillary sweating, decreased axillary hair and pubic hair. And there will be decrease in skin pigmentation. All this because th these are the signs of adrenal cortex failure. Then pituitary it releases a pituitary erythropoietic factor and if pituitary is affected there is decrease in pituitary erythropoietic factor so the female will have anemia, lethargy, and weakness. She will experience hypothermia, hypoglycemia, hypothyroidism, all features of hypothyroidism will be present and because there is less LH and FSH, there will be genital organ atrophy. The uterus of this female will be like the size of a menopausal female's uterus. So genital organ atrophy. Management in this condition is that you have to replace these hormones which are deficient. So the hormones which are replaced are TSH, ACTH, estrogen and progesterone another very important question remember e Sheehan syndrome is a syndrome which is very oftenly been asked in PGME questions not only the manifestations but also the management of Sheehan syndrome is important that is all what we have to know in uh, Sheehan syndrome then in hypothalamus or compartment 4 the causes of secondary amenorrhea as I told you they were excessive exercise excessive um, weight loss anorexia nervosa bulimia all these things they lead to decrease in the release of GnRH and because GnRH is decreased it leads to amenorrhea there is nothing more which we have to know there now how do you uh, diagnose a patient of secondary amenorrhea how do you come to know what is the cause of secondary amenorrhea whenever a patient of secondary amenorrhea comes to you first thing what you have to do is the three tests these three tests are pregnancy test I told you that the most common cause of secondary amenorrhea is pregnancy so always rule out pregnancy whenever a patient comes to you with secondary amenorrhea second 
because hypothyroidism is also an important cause of uh, secondary amenorrhea so you get the TSH levels tested and number three is you check the levels of prolactin if prolactin levels are raised there is hyperprolactinemia this means there is a pituitary tumor if all these three things are normal then you will go to the next step and the next step is progesterone challenge test in progesterone challenge test what we do is we give the patient progesterone which has got a least estrogenic activity like medroxy progesterone acetate medroxy progesterone acetate is given for five days and then it is suddenly withdrawn after withdrawing medroxy progesterone acetate if withdrawal bleeding is present if withdrawal bleeding is present this means that in this female the problem was less progesterone the moment you have given the female progesterone she has started menstruating now out of all the causes i am writing just the important ones so that we can you know correlate hypothalamus that was compartment 4 which was releasing GnRH pituitary that is compartment 3 and in pituitary I told you the common causes were adenomas and Sheehan syndrome then pituitary releases gonadotropins that is LH and FSH they act on ovary which is our compartment 2 the most important cause which I told you here to remember was PCOD and then from ovary estrogen is released and after ovulation there is progesterone both of which act on the uterus which forms the compartment 4 and the most common cause which I told you or the most important cause which I told you to remember was Asherman syndrome. Now I am telling you that after giving progesterone challenge test if withdrawal bleeding is present this means that the only problem in this female was that progesterone was absent the moment you have given progesterone to that female she has started menstruating now out of all these causes the problem in which progesterone is absent is PCOD because PCOD leads to an ovulation and which leads to less of progesterone so if after giving medroxy progesterone acetate withdrawal bleeding is present it means the problem was an ovulation there was no progesterone or the problem was PCOD but if withdrawal bleeding is absent this means we have to do further testing now what is the further testing further test is estrogen plus progesterone challenge test in estrogen and progesterone challenge test we create a situation like the normal menstrual cycle estrogen plus progesterone challenge test here we will give estrogen conjugated estrogen for 21 days and then in the last 5 to 10 days we will add progesterone this means we have created a situation like the normal menstrual cycle if after giving estrogen and progesterone challenge test still the patient does not bleed there is no withdrawal bleeding you give estrogen and progesterone and then stop giving it and if there is no withdrawal bleeding now see here till here whatever was the function till here the function was of hypothalamus pituitary ovary 
their function was to release estrogen and progesterone now this is something which we have done from outside and still if the patient is not bleeding it means the problem is somewhere lower down it means the problem is in the uterus and that means the problem is Asherman syndrome. I hope you have understood this because this is very frequently asked. If you haven't understood, I'm repeating. When you are giving estrogen and progesterone like a normal menstrual cycle, you yourself are doing what hypothalamus, pituitary and ovary are doing. So you are creating an artificial menstrual cycle. Their role is now no more there. Now still if the patient does not bleed, this means the problem is somewhere lower down. That means the patient is suffering from problem of the uterus and the most common cause I told you is Asherman syndrome. But if withdrawal bleeding is present, if withdrawal bleeding is present, now what will you do? If withdrawal bleeding is present then you will assess the levels of LH and FSH. If the levels of LH and FSH are raised this means there is hyper gonadotropism. And when will the levels of LH and FSH be raised? Again, referring to our previous knowledge. Estrogen, it has got a negative feedback on FSH and progesterone has a negative feedback on LH. LH and FSH levels, they will be raised whenever there is a problem in the ovary. If there is a problem in the ovary, the levels of estrogen and progesterone will be low so the negative feedback on FSH and LH will not be there so this means the problem is in the ovary that is there is ovarian failure now what is premature menopause premature menopause is menopause which occurs in a female less than 40 years of age whenever a female has menopause the follicles in the ovary they are few there are very few follicles in the ovary so the levels of estrogen are decreased and because the level of estrogen is decreased, the negative feedback on FSH is no more there. And so the levels of FSH are raised in menopausal females. Now the questions which they ask on FSH are number one, ovarian cycle is initiated by which hormone? Answer is FSH. Number two, to diagnose menopause, what is the single best test? You see the levels of FSH. If levels of FSH are raised in a female of menopausal age, then you can confirmly say that she is having menopause and number three which what is the marker for ovarian reserve and again the answer is follicle stimulating hormone ovarian reserve we need to check whenever a female complains of infertility if there is complaint of infertility and you want to know whether ovary has got sufficient follicles or not you check the levels of FSH because if the ovary does not have sufficient follicles that is ovarian reserve is less again the level of estrogen will be less so in turn the negative feedback on FSH will not be there and the levels of FSH will be raised now how will we know whether the cause for secondary amenorrhea is hypothalamus or pituitary till here we have come to know whether the cause is ovary whether the cause is PCOD or whether the cause is Asherman syndrome for knowing whether the cause lies in the pituitary or the ovary we have to do a test and that is called as GnRH dynamic test in GnRH dynamic test we give GnRH, IV GnRH and after 15 to uh, 30 minutes we check the levels of LH and FSH. If after giving GnRH the, the levels of FSH and LH do not increase, they remain normal, there is no increase, 
this means that there is some problem in the pituitary because once you are giving GnRH, pulsatile GnRH for a very small time, the levels of LH and FSH, they should increase. But if they are not increasing, this means the problem is in the pituitary. But if LH and FSH increase, this means pituitary is absolutely normal and the problem is in the hypothalamus. So that is how we do the workup of secondary amenorrhea and that is all what I have to tell you on amenorrhea. I hope you enjoyed today's lecture. Any, com any problem which you have whether in this topic or any other topic, please do write to me at drsakshiarora at the rate gmail.com. All your tips, all your suggestions, all your queries are welcome. Thank you. menopausal females so if you are